If you've ever thought of quilting your own projects but just don't know where to start, I have the perfect first steps for you. I've put together a PDF guide. I call it Three Steps Toward Freehand Freedom. These are the baby steps, but they can help you move past your overwhelm and show you that yes indeed, freehand quilting can be learned. So if you'd like to snag this PDF, There's a link in the show notes, or if you're an Instagram user, just message me three steps. That's the number three, S-T-E-P-S, and I'll send you that link. Let today be the day you get started. I have clothing even that I'll wear that's beaded and people will stop me and say, did you do that? And another friend of mine, we say the only answer to say if you're a quilter is no, but I could have. Welcome to Measure Twice, Cut Once, the podcast where we hear quilters and other crafters' stories and draw encouragement and even life lessons from them. In today's episode, my good friend Cheryl will be joining me. I'm your host, Susan Smith, coming to you from my quilting studio, Stitched by Susan. This is where my long arm Lucy and I spend lots of hours doing freehand, edge-to-edge quilting. Now, if you're not a quilter and those terms mean nothing to you, it's basically doodling on the surface of a quilt with a 50-pound writing implement with needle and thread attached and at really high speed. And if you are a machine quilter, I invite you to tune in to the live and unscripted events hosted on my YouTube channel, also called Stitched by Susan. These are streamed live the first and third Friday of every month. And they're interactive because they're live, so you can actually ask questions and get answers about that project while I'm working on it. So be sure and check those out. And another thing that I recently made available to machine quilters is my All Over Feather class. So quilters from way back will know that feathers are always eye-catching, it seems like, and the All Over Meandering ones are no exception. So in this free class, I'll show you how to achieve the graceful, sort of flowing feathers that you've always aspired to. From the basic feather shape, even coverage on the quilt, to avoiding awkward corners, or customizing the little details, it's all here in the class, and I'll walk you through it and demo the quilting step by baby step. So if that interests you, just head to my website, and a sign-up form for that class will pop up, and it is entirely free. Today's Pins and Needles is brought to you by The Will and Dave Show. Hi, I'm the Will half of The Will and Dave Show, a short little podcast that myself and the eponymous Dave like to record talking about the things that really matter to us, whether that's social, political, or pop culture. Usually we don't see eye to eye, but more often than not, we can find some common ground in there somewhere. And now, back to Pins and Needles with a quick tip for all you sharp quilters out there. I want to highlight a little tool that a lot of quilters don't know about, and I was one of those ignorant quilters until not too long ago. There's a little tool called a Hera marker, and that's spelled H-E-R-A, and it seems to be available at all craft stores. It's kind of an old-fashioned tool, but it is really, really useful for quilters. So whether you're working on the long arm, the domestic machine, or even hand quilting, here's one way that you can make use of it. It's basically like a plastic knife that you would have in your kitchen for cutting squares or bars, for example, in nonstick pans, right? You'll have a plastic knife that does not have serration on it, so it won't scratch. It's much like that tool, but pretty sturdy. And so to mark cross hatching, you can simply use a straight edge, some type of ruler, and this little Hera marker and draw, quote unquote, those lines on your quilting surface, on your fabric. Now, if you have something just a little bit soft with a little bit of give underneath, what'll happen is it will form a crease wherever that blade runs. And those creases, surprisingly, last and last. So you can mark your cross hatching, fold that piece of fabric away, and those creases will last until you are ready to quilt it. Hera marker, you should get one. You know by now that I love my coffee. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. There for the price of one delicious coffee, you're able to make a one-time contribution to the show. I thank you so very much for your support and maybe take a moment now to refill your cup as you settle back to enjoy today's interview. My 
My guest today is Cheryl Clausen. Cheryl's been quilting for quite a lot of years, and we call what she makes quilts, but really and truly, they are works of art. She has a gift for embellishing and beading and adding layers of detail and interest that seriously, you kind of need a magnifying glass to appreciate. So she's coming today to talk about some of her techniques and some of her projects that I know you'll love to hear about. Cheryl, thanks so much for joining me in the studio today. This is going to be great fun. Thank you, Susan. I'm thrilled to be here with you and honored. Here's the backstory. Cheryl and I are friends in real life, so you're going to get a real um, close-up close, close up look at the conversation between two friends today. That's how this <laughs> podcast is going to go. Cheryl is, we haven't known each other all that many years, but I first discovered her quilting in our local quilt show here in Spokane, Washington. And Cheryl has a very signature element, so we're going to dive into that today. And it becomes apparent when you see her first project, and that is Bling. So t- tell us why you love Bling and kind of what, what got you going on that path. Or have you always made quilts with Bling? You know, I didn't really think that I did until I started preparing quilts and speeches for um, when I was asked to speak at various smaller guilds. And I noticed that even in the beginning, even when I was brand new and a brand new quilter, I added embroidery or beading or some something to almost every one of my quilts, even from day one. Um, in fact, the very first quilt I ever made was, which was crazy, but it was a, a buttonhole applique quilt that one of our local shops was doing a block of the month. And I think what drew me to that, besides the applique itself, was they it had embroidery. You added some some elements of embroidery to it. So that's really, I think I started doing it right from the beginning. So maybe I was too broad in my description when I said bling, because I think of you kind of synonymous with sparkly and glitter. But the truth is, yes. bling is one thing, and embellishment is kind of another. And you do both. And embellishment, by that you mean fine details like layers and layers of details do you have any like particular examples about you know gorgeous little sheep that you've done up with french knots or like what kind of embellishments do you do that bring your projects to life usually um usually i do mostly applique needle turn applique or wool applique and so normally if there's a leaf which most quilts have leaves on them or like you said a sheep i will add french knots to sheep um, I did a Sue Spargo quilt that had a sheep on it, and even Sue Spargo commented <laughs> that I was nuts because it, I it completely knotted that sheep. I mean, there were French knots, drizzle stitch, you name it, colonial knots, whatever I could do to really fluff up that sheep. So, um, but normally I, especially on, and it's all about really the quilt itself and what it needs, what I think it needs. And so if it's a flower, I'll add, you know, some stamen, some French knots and some stem stitch. So I tend to do, I always embellish, I always embroider, I would say most of my, I would say all of my quilts, I embroider at some point to add detail. And then if it needs beading, which, you know, in my opinion, you can't not have beading, but some quilts, you you know, obviously, if they're too primitive, you don't want beads. But I usually will add some blends of some sort, meaning beading or, or I don't use crystals very often, but I like to bead. So. Right. And so that's more like crystals are kind of done with kind of a hot gun, aren't they in general? Yes, and the type of yes. beading you do is literally handwork because it seems like that yes. <laughs> detailed hand stitching that's so individual and so artistic is the kind of layer of extra touch that you love to add. Yes, it is. In fact, I'm wearing a shirt today in honor of that's covered in uh, bugle beads that I did not put on myself, but I have clothing even that I'll wear that's beaded and people will stop me and say, did you do that? And another friend of mine, we say the only answer to say if you're a quilter is no, but I could have. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm thinking of a particular project of yours that I remember hanging in a show that I love you to kind of describe as best you can for our listeners. And it was all in shades of purple. Tell us the story behind that project, if you would. So this quilt is named Purple Rain. I am in charge of the special exhibitions for our local guild, Washington State Quilters, and we do 
we've done Sherrywood for the last couple of years, which is usually a themed exhibition. And that year was Prince. So Prince had passed and he was from Minnesota and Sherrywood's located in Minnesota. And so it was a purple themed um, uh, challenge and um, to celebrate Prince. And I bought all the fabric and had my idea and then I just, as many of us do, I did not get it done. I procrastinated and I kept thinking that my thought for Purple Rain, that everyone would do that and I didn't want to be redundant. So anyway, then our uh, Long Arm Guild that same year had an, what they called an ombre challenge. So you had to use one color, you could add white and black, but everything, the thread embellishment, every single thing had to be that one color. Well, I still had all my purple fabric and my idea. So I put together a quote called Purple Rain. And um, although it didn't, there was no elements of Princeton and it, it was just the name. Um, and it was umbrellas with kind of these artistic faded out um, people in the background. And I beaded that, I beaded it totally beat it. I beat it. The rain, the sheets of rain coming down, the umbrellas have beating and, you know, other elements of embellishment. It's pretty embellished. It has, you know, I've done, I didn't do a lot of embroidery on that because um, we, I took black tulle and laid it over, but I beat it over the tulle. So it was a little bit tricky. And since it was a long arm challenge, I had to find a way to actually get the quilting in there because that's right. what I was really being judged on was the quilting, not so much anything else. I did win first place, which um, Susan was very excited and came running to tell me while I was hanging the Prince Challenge at the show, you won, you won first place. I've kept that secret for months. <laughs> and we stood in front of the quilt and so, took pictures and did the, a little happy little, dance. It's a little tiny backstory on that for our listeners because <laughs> Cheryl and I are in the same chapter of Washington State Quilters, plus we're both in this long arm machine quilting guild. And that particular year, I was on the board of the long arm quilting guild. So the pieces were all assembled earlier in the year and voted on and we knew what the placements were. And so I knew that Cheryl had first place that I had to sit on that for something like three months before the show <laughs> took place and you knew it. So phew, yes, we all and I, I had no idea. Secret. Well, we have extremely talented, and Susan's one of them, extremely talented long arm quilters. And I do mine on a domestic. It's a sit down long arm, but I do my quilting that way. And, um, you know, and so it was really exciting. But that quilt was very heavily beaded and is still heavy. And I had to do kind of a fake back on it, which I do for quilts. I have, if I'm heavily embellishing with beading, I do not want to bury knots. It's tricky because you have to do the quilting first and then add your beading and then the knots are going to show. And so it was a little bit tricky, especially with this one, since I was being actually judged on quilting. And um, so I had to do a light back and keep in the theme of the white and black and purple. And um, I could not come up with a really good idea of how to hide those knots, because that's typically what I'll do on something like that is I'll, I will quilt it, add the beading, more beading if I need to. And then I call it a fake back. I put on the actual backing to cover all the knots and stuff. And um, for this quilt, I went up to a local store and had, they have a lot of beautiful trims and, and lace and they, you know, bridal type fabric and found, I don't, I lucked into this exquisite piece of tulle um, with beading on it and some embroidery and it was pre-made and cut that and used that for the backing, which I personally loved that. I thought that so was- So it's almost reversible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I had it. People would look at that and go, did you beat that too? But you know the answer. No, but I could have. <laughs> exactly. So um, it, that was a fun quilt and I love that quilt still. So can I, you race through a couple of techniques in there that I think if we have quilters listening, they might actually want to take these home into their projects if they're embellishers too. One of them was that you used a layer of tulle. So there was actual layering of textures and fabrics and fun things in your quilt piece. And then you put tooling over it all. Am I telling that correctly? Or do you want to tell that? Yes. So, and I had taken a class recently from a, a landscape uh, speaker that came to our guild. I think it was Laura Fogg and her, that's her technique. She, mm -hmm. it's mostly raw, raw, raw edge applique. I'm absolutely, you know, I'm a hardcore needle turn, but in this situation, I knew what I wanted. And so you layer the pieces down and she has you pin them. And I had a lot of trim and stuff. So it was a little tricky. Actually, I had to completely take it off and remake it. I, it just didn't work, but her technique is to take tool 
once all of the pieces are assembled on your background, um, you take tool and that, and then pin that down and then you quilt over the tool. I technically do not use that. That's I've used that maybe twice in quilts, but this quilt required that. And then I beat it over that. So you're just taking raw edge applique, layering it how you want it, it you know, for a landscape, say, and right. um, then pinning it down and then you put the tool over it to sort of, you know, secure it all and quilt over that so it right. doesn't move. And I can see how that would be super useful if you had, you know, very intricate, which is why it lends itself to landscape, right? You've got these layers upon right. layers of fabrics and colors and shades, and they're maybe not very large, and you're trying to get hints of color here and there, and then you just lay that all down and hold it in place with that tooling. Okay, got that one. Uh, can I remember what the other technique was? I think it was your, your back. faux back. I think so. <laughs> yes. So basically, you just did whatever you needed to do to get all that handwork in place, and then you put an additional layer on the back of your quilt to sort of make it all neat and tidy and go away. Yes, because one of the things is, you know, when you're, and I, you can attest to this, Susan, because you are a long-arm quilter, so your quilter does not love you if you're doing a ton of beading on a quilt, I mean, you know, it's really tough to go around beading or embellishment, really. With the quilting. And I do, yeah. right, with the quilting. And I do my own quilting. I don't hand quilt. So I, what you have to do is think ahead. You have to think ahead on, you know, what, what you're going to do, especially if you know you're going to bead something pretty densely, which I do. I've done a couple quilts where I do that. I tend not to be quite that heavy, but this quilt called for it. And, um, so I, you have to think about, okay, well, I need to quilt it to get the pieces down and get it quilted. So I will tend to lightly quilt, lightly quilt the areas and background just to kind of get it tacked down. And I'll leave sp and knowing, and I, I already have the idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, I have the idea of how I'm going to beat it. In this quilt, I knew I needed slanted bugle beads coming down. And so, um, so I quilted that area, quilted the rest of it lightly, beaded it. And of course, when I'm beading, I'm, I'm attaching those beads individually. One mm -hmm. by one, I attach and secure each bead. And except for those bugle beads, which I did sort of, it's sort of in a running stitch almost, um, mm -hmm. which is, is, that can be very tricky. If you do that, you better make sure you don't have to make a mistake and change that. Because if you cut one, you're going to lose the whole, the whole, whole row. Mm -hmm. And ask me how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> ask me how I know how that happens, because... I got too close to where I was going to attach the binding and sure enough had to, and sure enough had to remove some of the beads that had gone too far over. And that was a little tricky, but um, so then, but when I'm attaching those, I'm, there's just, it, you can bury the knot. You can go kind of in between the layer of your, you know, the top and the batting and bury it. So, but so that it doesn't show and you're okay to go on. But for me, <clears throat> I do, a, if I'm doing a lot of beating, it's too time consuming to right. do that. So and I'm not, you know, I have not put any of these quilts in a huge show where that would be judged. So I, you know, just go back and I knot them off in the back and I'll, I'll bury the string, obviously. And then when I'm doing the faux back, then I, you know, and I already have that planned. I'll have the back. So once I'm complete with all of my beading, then I take, you know, a real backing that matches the quilt. I, you know, will put the backing on in the usual way, but all, obviously I've done some quilting, but I've left enough quilting so I can kind of go around and still tack that back down so it's not loose. So it's still somewhat quilted and held right. down. Yeah. And then that the binding, I do, yeah. It just seems like a more sensible way, you know, as you say, particularly if you're not expecting this to be judged and critiqued, you know, officially. Right. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying to create an artistic piece. So that's a sensible right. way to cover up all your, you know, handwork and knots and still make it be manageable in terms of time. I love that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and I love that too. Yeah. So a, a little bit changing gears and topic. We were talking earlier about the long arm guild that we're a member of and the general quilting guild. And I know that you've been longtime members in both of these. And you and I actually are really fortunate to belong to some high quality, high level of um, people that are in these guilds. So just yes. <laughs> kind of how important do you think that is in a quilter's life? How influential maybe has that been for you personally to be inspired by and have the bar raised by these wonderful guilds that we're members of? Well, for Washington State Quilters, that's our guild, our local guild. It's a very large guild, very active members. We have a beautiful quilt show, and we have talented quilters. And I think it depends, and people, and it's a, it, you can pay to have your quilt judged, but 
I never do that. I just, I make quilts and I never make quilts with the thought, unless it's a challenge of putting a quilt, you know, putting it in the show. I make it. And if it turns out <laughs> the way I want it to, I will enter it in the show. So you're and, making it um, just as an expression of your art. And then you yes. take it to the show to show off what you've created, not necessarily with the goal of winning ribbons. No, but if I put something in, I'm hopeful, obviously. But of again, course. this is, it's a people's choice. It's a people's choice. And, you know, that's has been a, a challenge, I think, for a lot of us who, you know, do co what I would consider quality work. And, you know, it's, that's the judging in that case. Some of the ribbons aren't really always you know, based on um, workmanship, I would say, rather right. than they can be you know, based on popularity, popularity or... and how they appeal right. to most of the people yes. who are viewing. And, and I do not make quilts for that reason. I don't make quilts that will broadly appeal. I make quilts that I like that I know right. I'm going to hang and love. And I do. I mean, I put a lot of time since I'm doing needle turn. That's very t labor intensive. Then you're adding embroidery. That's labor intensive. And if you're adding beads, that's labor intensive. And you know, but I do that because I love that work. I love mm -hmm. that work. And I'm inspired, though, by I've been inspired by many of the our quilters, Susan, in fact, when she I think when I don't know, my first experience with you was when you won, you know, best of show and several ribbons on your uh, tulip pink butterfly that it was just such a stunning piece of work. And, you know, that makes you it pushes you to if you want to get better, it pushes you to, um, you know, to work harder or, um, you know, you get inspired by other people's work. The long arm guild, I did not think I was pushed to join that. I'm a sit down, you know, I'm moving the quilt, not the machine. And so I wasn't going to join that guild. I just didn't think, um, I don't know, but ever since I joined that guild, I can honestly say my quilting, my machine quilting really stepped up because mm -hmm. we had teachers that came. We had, you know, there's so much inspiration. There's so many fantastically talented uh, members of that guild that share their ideas and their inspiration. And so I feel like joining that just for whatever reason, I don't know if it was absorption or just the whole thing. I feel like I stepped up my game. I think it's joining challenges though. I tend to like to do challenges because mm -hmm. it pushes me for a deadline. I'm a very deadline driven person, you know, so yeah. um, it pushes me to do that. And I tend to get too really immersed in detail. So for me, a deadline makes me have to choose what I'm going to do and so I can get it done. Yep, get focus. And actually, thinking back over my words, I, I misspoke when I called it a long armors guild because it's not. It's a machine quilting guild. So you're not the only oh, person yes. by any means who uses a sit down or a domestic. But there right. is certainly something about that community. And I know when we had in-person meetings, we used to break out into groups by brand. And for me, mm -hmm. as a new quilter, especially some years back, that was so, so helpful because you had this pool of knowledge and skill and you would sit and have, it was just 10 or 15 minutes. You would break out by brand and you could ask any question about tension or about threading or whatever it wanted, whatever your question was and find, you know, help there. And that was so beneficial. I agree. That was extremely beneficial. And I had people that had just bought the same machine I have and that had joined way after me. And when we broke out, we actually split off them because there were actually people that had that machine I had, which is the, you know, Bernina 20 sit down. So it's a long arm head, but you're sitting down and, you know, you don't get much training on those, as you know, I don't think for any of those machines. So, you know, I think it was helpful and it's helpful to be inspiring to other people as well. It is. It, it kind of gets your thought processes going, you know, when you're bouncing ideas off of other people. Always a good thing. Right. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so I'd like to talk for a couple minutes. We've talked at length about embellishments because there's really no end to that particular rabbit hole. But you do <laughs> no. needle turn applique and you also do a lot of wool applique. So maybe in a few sentences, define what we mean by wool applique for our listeners. So wool applique is, um, you can use mixed media, but typically it's a wool background, you know, and I used hand dyed wool. Um, it's a wool background and wool pieces that you are appliquing down, but it's not needle turn. It's a very generous and forgiving, beautiful way to make, you know, wall hangings or, you know, little pillows or, you know, any of those things where you're, and you can, uh, a lot of people fuse. I am not a fuser, um, but a lot of people will fuse down and just stitch it down, but it's easy. So, you just. So am I reading this correctly then? You do not 
wool is not woven like cotton fabrics are. So you don't need to finish that raw edge. You can literally cut out your shape and then affix it and add your pretty stitching and embellishments and you're good to go. Yeah. And, or, or not. So, uh, there's a lot of people that will, they'll, you know, they'll use um, fusible and put it on the back of their applique and fuse it down and they're good to go. I mean, they, sometimes they don't even stitch it down, oh, but okay. you know, most of us say that you should do that, but I mean, and it still will look good. It will still look, um, it will look good. So it's a very, very forgiving medium. And I absolutely love working with, wool. my dad was in the wool business his whole career and I, I love did not working know with that. wool. Yeah. So I, it's, I love working with, well, it's forgiving. Um, it manipulates easily. So, um, you know, you're not, and like I said, you're not finishing the edge. You are really, you're either whip stitching it down or buttonhole stitching it or like I said. But it's not going to fray like, like cotton fabric would. Right. It won't. I use, I tend to use, um, woven wool. It's wool and it can, especially some of the hand dyed and If you don't fuse it, it might fray a little bit, but I'm whip stitching it down. I'm actually stitching it down. And then I always quilt. I would say 90% of the time, if it's a larger piece, I still quilt my piece, but you don't have to. All of the penny rugs that are made don't require quilting. You can use fusible batting and put a, you know, uh, any kind of a back on it. And one of the things, Sue Spargo inspires me and I use, uh, she mixes mediums. So you can put cotton you know, you can use cotton background or wool, you can mix it. And I love that look. Okay. So I caught the phrase penny rug. Define a penny rug for me. I don't know what that is. So penny rugs are very old, very, you know, they've been around for centuries and it's usually round or oval. So it's cut in a round or oval piece. And then you'll, you know, place your pieces on your applique, whether it's a cornucopia, let's say I'm doing one for Thanksgiving and get those pieces down and it's round. And then you make these little um, tags or tabs, I would say they're, they can be round, they can be oval, but you'll see them and they go all the way, you stitch them all the way around the, you know, they call them penny rugs, but they're not rugs, but you put them all the way around. So they have these little tabs that usually with another circle or something in the middle of them. And they go all the way around your piece. So is this to be used like a table topper? Is that the purpose of it? Yes. It's not a rug. I gathered that. (laughs) No. And I try to hang those because I'm me and I try to hang those and it's impossible because they're wiggly. There's, they're loose. You know, you're attaching them to the very edge of your piece all the way around. So they're sort of a loose piece and they look fantastic as a table topper. Awesome. So in general, then, with the wool applique type pieces, they're not intended to be used like a quilt would be as a covering blanket, you know, folded. Oh, used. no. <laughs> they are strictly decorative and they're art. And the wool colors to me, maybe talk about the hand dyed for a bit, but the wool colors always seem so rich and warm to me. Yes. And the, now it used to be you couldn't find, you know, you couldn't find that people would go to Goodwill and buy Pendleton shirts and cut them apart and wash them in hot water and dry them to get that wool. But now there are so many people out there that do beautiful, um, just that hand dyed, rich, vibrant color. Um, I personally, I do not, I will say this, these are not meant to be washed either. They're not meant to be blankets and they are not meant to be washed. Um, I do not pre-wash my wool since they are hand dyed. They've been pre-washed, but you never really know if something's going to bleed or not. So they're not meant for that. They're purely decorative. Um, and even the larger pieces that I've made, same thing. They are not meant to be. So I take how, very good how care of those. how would you clean them? Because if they're on a tabletop or a side table or something, they're going to get dusty. How do you clean them? I actually have a little, I have a little, um, there's, I have one of those little portable vacuums that you can use for your computer or your sewing machine. Oh, I'll okay. use that. And the other thing, and I tried this before because, you know, there's, you try different things to get that dust off. And one time I had a candle melt on one of mine and I was oh, sick because it was a pineapple. I loved this thing. And I just did old school. I took my hair dryer and a paper towel and melted that wax and soaked it up and got most of it up, which was a, which was a relief. But usually you just, you can either use a vacuum to kind of get the dust off, or you can use one of those fiber cloths and just wipe mm-hmm. it off, you know, cause if you're going to leave it for a long time, obviously it will get dusty. And I will say that in talking about this, I would say that I've probably only made three or four, maybe five quilts that were utilitarian. I have always made quilts that are meant to be displayed and hung. They do not go on my bed. Um, I made a beautiful applique quilt for my grandson 
and it's it had these little cartoon things uh strips that you embroider it took me forever and i gave it to them and i said this is meant to, you can put it on his bed but it's meant for you know just a covering and was just appalled when they were washing and washing and washing that quilt <laughs> but it held up but that's also because i quilt pretty densely so but yeah so i will say that most of my quilts are meant to be displayed and hung not meant to be laid on a bed or you know and i so, have dogs so. so you and i are proof positive that within the quilting in air quotes genre there is just this enormous range of taste and style and aesthetic because i'm quite a utilitarian quilter i make quite a lot of quilts but they usually don't have super fussy piecing i love edge to edge quilting that's my thing you're all about the little fine intricate details <laughs> so it's two really different styles and we still call yes. this quilting it's really two different crafts but we still all call this quilting well, I would say that even your utilitarian quilt, Susan, are beautiful and your quilting is always stunning. Even if it's edge to edge, it's interesting. Well, I do and, endeavor to make fun. make the serviceable quilt, you know, beautiful. But nevertheless, my style is, is quite utilitarian compared to yours. And I've been always a fussy. I started every quilt I have made since day one, really. I don't enjoy piecing. That's The truth of the matter is I piece because I have to, because it's part of a background or something, but I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy the cutting I am not as accurate and detailed as I am of a needle turn applicator or embroiderer or whatever. I am not a very accurate piecer. And so my quilts don't turn out the way I think they should because I don't know what it is. It's like I have a mental block about piecing that I need to get over. But um, I, don't, I don't know that I you don't have think to. That's my thing. You know that embellishing <laughs> is your thing. So just, just live in yes. it. Yes. So what yes. has, in your day job, you're an accountant. So what has yes. this really artistic craft, what do you think that's brought into your life? Why, why do you do it? Well, I think that when you think, when I think back, I was never, ever going to be an accountant or a tax professional. I always was going to be a writer. That was my plan. So I think I've always had that really strong, creative mind. I was embroidering when I was a teenager. I had a mother that made, you know, uh, our, all of our skating costumes. And so I came from a, a long line of women in our, in our family who did, you know, handcraft type work. My mother was a rug hooker. And, um, and so um, I fell into this job. I was good at it. It's a very highly detailed job. But because it's so narrow and you can't really be creative, obviously, in this True. job, you, I really needed that outlet for my creativity, which was just always, I would say it's almost like a fire, you know, burning. I mean, you know, that feeling where you just, mm -hmm. you just need to get that out. So for me, it's my sanity, but even though I'm still, it's, I'm still doing that creative thing, but I'm still doing that really finely detailed, you know, work. So I still must be equally balanced right and left brain with detail and creativity. Cause I'm still, what I do is still detailed, but it just, it brings, it really helps that outlet is just what I need to, it, I need that to be happy and feel fulfilled, I think. I can totally see that. So in kind of closing, I always ask my guests if they have a nugget to share. Now you kind of touched on one there, so it's up to you if you want to come up with another one or not. But I kind of asked for a little nugget. Like what is something that your craft has taught you or maybe that it has opened a door for you or given you an aha moment? Have you got one of those you want to share? I had two. They're kind of dumb, but they're, one of them was no such one thing. of the really one sentence thing was you can't finish if you don't start. I find mm -hmm. so many people, especially in my demos and things like that, say, I'm scared. I bought this kit. I, like if I was doing a wool applique demo, I have this kit. It's been sitting there and I'm scared to start. And I always say, you know, if you don't start it, it's still just going to sit there. You have nothing to lose by starting because what's the worst that's going to happen? It, it might not turn out great, but you may enjoy the process. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a learn. Every single thing you start is a learning. It's a learning process in your step if you're being creative. And um, same thing when I get people saying I can't, you know, you just seem to go for it with your quilting. And I say, I just do. I sit down, I come up with an idea, and I tell myself, if this doesn't work, I'm not ripping it out, and I'll just have to keep going. And you and I have touched on that. You just have to keep going. And, there will always um, be another project, but that's no reason yes. to not try it on this one. Right. So yeah. I think that's my nugget is that you just have to try. If it's something you think you want to do and you've got it, you've got the kit or the fabric. There's lots and lots of help out here, thankfully now, especially with social media 
in the quilting community. And we all, I I would say by and large, we all are really supportive of each other and Mm -hmm. our ideas. And so you'll find help. I mean, you'll find help. You'll find somebody that can, there's Facebook groups, there's Instagram. I mean, there's so many places to get help. And if you don't start it, it's just going to sit there. And I have people that I see buy the same machine I have and you see them selling it. They were afraid to start. They just bought the machine and it sat there, you know, Mm -hmm. and they, I'm scared to start. And I was a little afraid, but I just go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I don't know what I don't know. I just, I'm dumb enough to just do it. (laughs) That's exactly, that should be my pithy quote. I don't, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And that's the truth. (laughs) I don't know if this beating idea is going to work. I don't know if I go too close to the edge, if it's all going to come off. I just go for it and then fix it because things for the most part can really be fixed. That's true. That's true. Yes. That's great. So, well, do you, would you like to share any of your social media sites? Like where do you share pictures of your work, for example? I'm on Instagram. I think I'm Cheryl MC nine on Instagram. And then I just have Facebook. I'm, you know, I'm just, I I don't know what I am on Facebook, but I'm on Facebook. I don't have a website and I don't have TikTok. Um, But I do share most of my pictures on on Instagram. I'll just say on Instagram then. How's that? Yeah. And I mean, I have a Facebook first. I think it's just Cheryl Clausen. Yeah. So I encourage you to go have a look at Cheryl's pictures and you'll, it will bring um, visual pictures of what we've been talking about. This wool applique, the sheep I alluded to earlier, he's a few posts back and someone was wanting yeah. to, you know, pet him through the screen. He's just so realistic <laughs> with these little thready curls. Love him. Anyway. And you know, if Sue Spargo saying, what were you thinking? And she is... <laughs> I, you know, I get so much inspiration from her. I love her and it's her quilt. It was her pattern. And so for sure her to say that, I thought, oh, maybe I went too far on my sheep. (laughs) No, never too much embellishment. Not for you. No. Okay. So I'll be sure and put that link in the show notes. So um, yeah, people can check out the pictures and I'll maybe even link to Sue Spargo's work. She's very a leader in the field of wool applique and and embellishing. So it's, it's inspiring to look at her work. If this has interest you at all, piqued your interest, check out her shop and her designs. So thanks ever so much for joining me. We'll do this again sometime. Thank you, Susan. I I really enjoyed it. I'm honored that you asked me to do this with you. And thank you for tuning in to the show. If you enjoyed this podcast, do consider leaving a review on Apple Podcast or the podcast app of your choice. It really helps other listeners to find the show so they can hear these stories too. Plus, I'd love to hear from listeners who'd like to nominate a crafter with a story to tell. Email me at info at stitchedbysusan.com and don't forget to CC the nominee. So until next time, may your sorrows be patched and your joys be quilted.